September 11, 2001, where were you? I was a freshman at the University of Maine Farmington. I just started college, having graduated in the spring of 2001 from Levitt Area High School. And I was in a uh, politics government 101 class hmm. uh, early in the morning uh, when the uh, professor uh, canceled class and told us all to go somewhere and uh, perhaps find a television because something, uh, something was happening. Didn't tell you what it was? I don't think he knew completely himself. Well, so you did that? Uh, I don't have a, a perfect recollection of, of, of what happened next uh, mm -hmm. for me, but um, that does jump out. Yeah. It's the moment you know, when I was first aware that something was occurring. And from what you recall, I mean, that, as you found things out, people around you found, what was that day like on a college campus in rural Maine? What was that like? Yeah, I mean, that was a terrible day. I think uh, one of my colleagues in the Armed Services Committee said it well uh, in a hearing last Wednesday that uh, you know, for a, a lot of uh, young Americans, thank God, they don't necessarily know what that feeling of fear uh, and hurt and anger uh, you know, is uh, that so many of us associate with 9-11. With uh, so I think w we all felt that in some way. And for many Americans, you knew someone or someone that knew, you know, had, had a close association with, uh, with, with New York. Um, yeah or the Pentagon, uh, or, or someone. So um, even in rural Maine, there were students there at University of Maine Farmington who were worried about someone that they knew or, 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 or loved who worked in the city. Yeah. You didn't have anyone directly? No, I didn't have that. anyone um, you know, who, who was uh, yeah. in the towers or, or worked uh, nearby. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I, th I think for a lot of people, that was um, just a a terrible moment uh, in time, and, and was for days, right? As they as they wondered, you know, is what, what's the status of yeah. a family member or a colleague or, or a friend or someone you went to school with? And everybody wondered, is something else going to happen? That's right. Yeah, is there going to be more attacks, right? Yeah. And is it correct to say that as a result of September 11th, you left school and? Joined the Marines. Absolutely, that's the uh, you know, uh, driving force for me. But everything that that took place from 9/11, you know, going forward, uh, many months. Uh, you were just talking about the the fear that there would be follow-on attacks. You can remember um, the threat levels throughout the fall and and into uh, you know the spring. Um, you know, uh, I can remember uh, as the kind of fall and. Uh, spring went on, uh, reading the papers uh, about Iraq uh, and concerns, you know, at that time that they had uh, an affiliation with, with terrorist organizations, and I was following all of that very closely. I remember the President's State of the Union address in mm. uh, early 2002, watching that and, and being very moved by it. Uh, ultimately, um, I joined the Marines in, in 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, yes, you, th clearly it moved you to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you then, as a res you then became part of that war that that ensued. Correct. I uh, was in the Third Battalion, Six Marines. Uh, that's an infantry unit uh, off the East Coast. I served at Camp Lejeune, and uh, we declared war in Iraq while I was in boot camp. And then I went on my first deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, in 2004, right on the Pakistani border up in the mountains. Hmm. Um, we were co-located uh, at a base with uh, Army SF units, and it was pure counterterrorism. So hmm. that was a deployment that was uh, fully associated with 9-11 and the effort to bring to justice uh, the perpetrators of 9-11, Osama bin Laden and, and, and his captains and lieutenants and foot soldiers. And was it this may sound stupid, but was it clear to all of you that your, your uh, boot camp um, 
cohorts and, and others when you're deployed. That's why we're here. We're here to get the people who attacked the U.S. Without any question, yes. Every one of us knew why we were in Afghanistan. We were, we were there because of 9-11. Uh, bin Laden was the number one goal, uh, but anyone that had anything to do with it as well. Yeah. And we were very clear about that. I don't, I don't know anyone that I served with in that time frame uh, when I served active duty 2002 to 2006 who wasn't moved in some way to join because of 9-11. Hmm. Uh, and there was no question about what the, the mission in Afghanistan was. Uh, so, uh, in fact, um, you know, at the beginning of the deployment, in case anyone had forgotten, uh, we watched footage of the towers being struck, mm. of individuals jumping out of those burning towers to avoid burning to death, but obviously falling, uh, you know, knowing, uh, had to have known that they were jumping to their own death. Uh, you know, that's tough footage for, for anyone to watch, uh, yeah. but we watched it before we went. You were, what, 20, 21? 20 years old. 20 years old, going to war to get the people who had attacked your country. Yeah. Um, does it seem like 20 years ago? Does it seem like a long time ago, or does it sometimes seem like yesterday? It feels like a long time ago, to be honest, Don. Um, I've been out of the Marines active duty um, for since two, December of 2006. I did serve uh, some extra time, uh, you know, in, in a reserve unit. Uh, uh, you know, when I was here in Lewiston, going to school at, at Bates, yeah. uh, I drilled actively. But um, you know, I haven't deployed uh, as a member of the Armed Forces since. Uh, I got home from Iraq in 2006, so it, it feels like a long time ago. Yeah. But the, the memories are, are, are strong. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we don't need to get into that much, but l you, I think you mentioned a few minutes ago that you and a lot, of your, a lot of your comrades from the military have had to deal with all of the aftermath of that in the, in the years since you left the service. Yeah, I, ha I hesitate to call it dealing with it. Um, you know, those, I don't have any regrets. I would do it again. Um, I value my service and uh, what I learned from it and who um, I've become as a result of it uh, in every way. So uh, the, uh, those are some tough experiences, no doubt. And, and, and I would say, you know, there's a lot of people out there that had tougher experiences than, than my own. Uh, that's my personal uh, opinion, so I don't mean to you know, speak to, to their experiences, but um, uh, these things make you who you are, and, and uh, some, t some of it can be, can be very hard uh, to come to grips with. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, having done that, I think it, you can also get to a place where you view it as having made you stronger, too. How much did 9-11 change this country, do you think? Significantly. One of the most uh, impactful uh, catastrophes, uh, events in my lifetime. Um, I don't know if anyone could make a straight face argument otherwise. Uh, it, it changed the trajectory of, of, of our future as a country. Hmm. And still dealing with it? Yes will be for a long time. Hmm. For a l average person might, you know, they confront, they to confront's the wrong word, but they deal with TSA if they were going to travel. Mm -hmm. And we have the uh, real ID for our driver's license and some things like that. But do those impacts, and, and we have had a war for 20 years, but do the impacts go beyond those things? Yeah, the Patriot Act, FISA phone taps, changes in warrants, uh, you know, um, by the way, follow-on efforts by Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations to attack the homeland, uh, the, uh, developing social media and the way those organizations started then to try and uh, recruit lone wolf actors uh, to, to carry out attacks uh, as individuals. Uh, the the counter-terrorism you know, mission 
or the terrorist threat, the international terrorist threat, has not gone away. Uh, and that's something that I think that we will be dealing with for the rest of our lives, unfortunately. Well, it's sad to think about. It is, but it's necessary. Do you think most Americans realize that? I don't know, Don. I guess you'd have to talk to them. But I think in part, if they don't, it's because we've done our job since 9-11. Uh, the young men and women uh, uh, and the professionals that make a career out of it uh, who have answered the call to serve uh, in, in some ways because we've done uh, the job uh, and people have gone uh, over there for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say over there, I don't just mean Afghanistan. Uh, we've helped to shield this country from another 9-11 type attack. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been um, you know, attacks. We know that there there have been. We've had, you know, incidences uh, again uh, in in New York and um, you know others, uh, right. you know, through the years. But nothing yeah. like, like what happened on 9/11. Right. And how worried should we be that there will be more attacks inside this country? I think the. Because we haven't had another 9-11 uh, uh, level or scale uh, attack, we should feel confident uh, that we're capable of preventing them, Don. But I think that that, that worry is always there, particularly for people who, whose job it is to think about that, uh, to plan for it, and who, you know, the folks on the front lines responsible for trying to prevent it. You, you think about you mentioned that? mentioned TSA. I can tell you the people that work at the Department of Homeland Security are thinking about that. You know, is, and people worry about some of the inconvenience of having to take off their shoes, uh, going through security, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, the threat is there, and we should worry about it. But I don't think we can let it control us, uh, or either our individual lives or, or our, our collective lives as, as Americans. We've we got to uh, be focused on the things that make our lives valuable. Uh, the things that we love and, and on what makes us great as a country. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of uh, the whole point. Uh, terrorism is designed to have a political impact. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's been conveyed by leaders through the years that while we have to be uh, militarily ready uh, and willing uh, to deploy to, to uh, protect the homeland, uh, we also need to be, uh, I think, psychologically uh, equipped to continue to to be Americans and, and to live the the life that um, you know, we believe in and that we uh, believe to be worth living. The current uh, political division in the country does that does it make does it make all of that more difficult? Of course it does. You know, I watched General Mattis uh, as Secretary of Defense uh, going to Afghanistan. There's footage of this you can find uh, talking to you know, young men and women in uniform who, some of whom were, were just little kids uh, on 9-11, telling them, stay focused on what you're doing here and don't pay attention to the political fights and division back home. You know, that's not representative uh, of America or how America views you uh, in, in what you're doing. It is unfortunate that a general or a secretary of defense would ever have to go there and, and even remind people of that yeah. uh, while, while they're uh, deployed uh, in defense of our nation. So yeah, the, the division makes it harder. Mm. The, and obviously for the civilian population here at home, it uh, co at least complicates it, if not makes it more difficult for people to to keep focused on making things better. It, uh, I've wondered if that political division would, would prevent the kind of response we had as a country 20 years ago to the 9-11 attacks. Do you think it would? It wouldn't hold me back uh, <laughs> from doing the right thing, and I don't think it would hold most people back. Uh, but I understand you know, the, the sentiment. Um, you know, politics wasn't any you know, exactly uh, all, you know, roses and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, c 
kumbaya in, in the late 90s and right. early 2000s. In fact, there was a contested presidential election in Absolutely. 2000. And um, the 9-11 attacks we, were less we, than a year after that. We did come together after 9-11 uh, in a very strong way. Uh, and I, um, I think that we would today uh, as well. Hmm. Uh, we, we need to remember that, though. I'm sticking with General Mattis, who I really respect a lot. Um, he likes to talk about uh, something that President Abraham Lincoln uh, said in the context of you know, thinking about our Civil War. Uh, he, Lincoln was, uh, I think, um, liked to tell p folks that all the armies of Europe combined could try to come across the Atlantic and invade the United States and would not make it uh, over the Appalachian Mountains before they were thrown back into the sea. Uh, that the only threat to America was America itself. Hmm. Hmm. That's a pretty good, pretty good statement from, what, 160 years ago? And, and some tough politics back then, too. So, I, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm not, yes, it's, there's, there are deep political divisions in the country right now, but I don't, um, I'll, I don't contemplate for a moment uh, where my loyalties lie, which is to the country. Uh, to the Constitution, to our communities, you know, to, to each other. And you think that's true of most Americans, too? I do. Talk a little bit, if you would, about, we were talking before, about where we're at now with Afghanistan. Um, and you already said that, that um, you supported President Trump's decision to have the military finally withdraw. Uh, and now that it's happened, um, amid great, great uh, criticism, great chaos, um, does does the way this happened reflect at all badly on the U.S. or is it just the, the kind of the pain of pulling yourself out? It does not at all reflect on anyone that served in uniform. I want to be clear about that. Uh, every one of them should hold their heads up high, uh, be proud of who they are, uh, and what they were willing to do for the country. They, they answered the call. Uh, as we all know there is no draft. These are all people who stepped forward and uh, said that they wanted to uh, put their lives on the line uh, f for our country. So. Um, they have won every battle fought in Afghanistan. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, there needs to be a, a political uh, responsibility for uh, having a vision for what we want to accomplish in Afghanistan and uh, to define um, on our terms uh, how we will ultimately get out. Uh, there may be some people who think we should uh, keep troops in Afghanistan forever. Uh, but I don't think that the majority of Americans uh, believe that that's the uh, desired outcome or was ever the objective. So, um, that said, did we, did we do this badly? The withdrawal has, without question, uh, <laughs> been... F anyone that tries to argue that this has gone well, I think, is wrong and uh, is putting a spin on it. From a tactical you know, kind of analysis, no, it has not gone well. Um, strategically, the decision to bring our troops home from Afghanistan uh, was the right one. The majority of the American people agree with that. Um, and I personally uh, think that it was as well. It was time to bring our troops home from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, we got bin Laden. We got him in 2011. Uh, we still hold some individuals responsible for 9-11 in Guantanamo. Uh, you know, the price of housing the uh, people responsible for 9-11 for the Taliban was being cast out of power for 20 years. Yeah, so for me, uh, the original objective was completed when we got bin Laden. Uh, but as I've alluded to, it's never going to be over. 
that threat is still out there and we always have to be vigilant and our government is always going to be responsible for preventing uh, a, a future uh, attack like what happened on 9-11. On Do, does Afghanistan still pose a threat to us or at least some of the people there as they did 20 years ago? Potentially as a potential haven for terrorist organizations like ISIS-K, uh, yes, but so too uh, Libya or Iraq or Syria or Iran or the Philippines or Pakistan. Could go on. I mean, there are terrorist organizations operating in countries around the world and we need to have the ability uh, to monitor that and, as necessary, do something about it, militarily speaking, mm -hmm. uh, and diplomatically. Uh, th th that is a constant requirement for the United States government these days. Are we, as, are we sufficiently uh, just in... Just to put a finer tune point yeah. on that, Don. My point being, we can't have a military presence on the ground in every one of those countries at all times. Um, and does the, 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 the chaos of our withdrawal, um, we still depend on allies in different parts of the world. Uh, has that reflected badly on us? Is there going to be a lasting impact of that? Or do you think that will diminish over time? I think that that combined with the withdrawal from Syria, which left some of our Kurdish allies in a very tough situation with an inv invading Turkish military, uh, these two things on top of each other in such a short period of time is going to have some, I think, long-term consequences in regards to whether or not elements of different societies uh, like um, you know, different groups in Afghanistan or uh, in other countries in the Middle East, like the Kurds, are going to want to take the, you know, the risk mm -hmm. of joining alongside our efforts in their, in their homeland. Yeah, there's definitely uh, mm -hmm. a, a potential uh, negative consequence there. Yeah. So we may have, may, we may have some, some bridges to rebuild. Perhaps. Maybe, yeah. Um, and think in the military. I just Go ahead. Here's uh, a, a point I, I, I would like to make. Yeah. Last year in a hearing, I asked uh, you know, senior members of our military leadership if they believed that the Afghan National Army was able to defeat uh, the Taliban or sustain itself without United States troops on the ground? And the answer was no. Uh, we can send you that, that footage. Uh, I also asked whether or not the Trump administration was involving the Afghan government in negotiations with the Taliban. Uh, this is in the House Armed Services Committee hearing. And, and they said no. So if you think about that, uh, you know, we've known for a long time now that first the Trump administration and then the Biden administration were in direct negotiations with the Taliban about a withdrawal of U.S. armed forces on the ground in Afghanistan and that they were not negotiating, n nor were they really intending to negotiate uh, with the Afghan uh, National Army. Hmm. Now, some people have you know, wondered out loud whether or not they could hold out for five years or two years or a year or two weeks. Hmm. Um, but the record is there. I think it's been clear uh, among the leadership, elements of our leadership, to, to include two presidents that are pulling our troops out with strategically in the best interest of the United States of America and likely to result in the fall of the Afghan government, which was, uh, I think, riddled with corruption after 20 years of trying to build a civil society there and a government capable of running a democracy. It was uh, completely dependent upon the United States and foreign uh, governments mm -hmm. for assistance, an economy that cannot come close at all to sustaining itself, and a military that could not uh, defend that government. 
despite years of efforts to eradicate uh, the production of opium, it's still rampant in that country uh, and is a, is a huge problem. So you have to ask yourself after 20 years, and in particular since the, the shift away from the Al-Qaeda terrorism, counterterrorism mission towards nation building, after all that time and all that money spent, did you expect a different result? Mm. Or were we to stay for another decade or more? Yeah. I believe that the answer is no. And as we deal with a evolving world, with rising threats uh, from what we in uh, Congress talk about as n near peer competitors like China and Russia, which did not really exist 20 years ago right. when 9-11 took place, we have to ask ourselves, where, sh where is the greatest threat and where must our focus be? Uh, and what resources does our military have uh, in place? And <laughs> if, um, if necessary to uh, be doing, um, let's say, counterterrorism in the Middle East uh, and nation building, while also shifting our focus to the Pacific and dealing with wh what's going on with Russia in Eastern Europe, uh, something's got to give at some point. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we're going to have to continue to put more and more resources into what is already a very well-resourced uh, military, the, mm -hmm. the strongest military in the world. But uh, politically, I think there's a need to prioritize where is the greatest strategic threat at this moment. Uh, my judgment uh, and, and the judgment of a lot uh, of leaders, uh, to include multiple presidential administrations going back to the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, is that we need to find a way to disentangle from these conflicts in the Middle East to the greatest extent possible, keep an eye on the counterterrorism. Uh, mission requirement, but really focus on the Pacific, on our global uh, you know, sea power uh, presence, and on Russia, which is a, a clear threat and an aggressive one. Yeah. Circle back to 9-11. To um, have you ever thought, geez, what would my life be like? What would I have done if the 9-11 attack hadn't happened? To be honest, I don't. I, I haven't done that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, like I said, I am so proud of uh, the time that I spent serving in the Marines and all the people that I served alongside, and I am equally as proud of all everyone else that has served, even if I don't know them, because I know what they did. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, it's so ingrained in uh, who I am today, Don, that I don't waste any time contemplating what might have been uh, if 9-11 hadn't happened. That being said, I, I, do, I did want to make an important point today. Uh, you wanted to talk about 9-11. Uh, for me, 9-11 is about the victims mm -hmm. of 9-11. It's about their families. It's about all of the first responders who uh, gave their lives that day to try and save others. And as you pointed out, the many others who went and have had long-term impacts, their mental health because of what they experienced and saw, uh, physical ailments with our firefighters dealing mm -hmm. with cancers because of what they encountered uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, but on that pile as well, the toxins and everything, uh, it's had a massive impact on so many thousands of people. I think about them. On, I, I honest, you know, to God, spend the last few years uh, on 9-11. I start the day uh, by turning on a recording of the firefighters going up the tower. I forget which tower it was. You, I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, in the final moments as the towers start to come down, they're saying, we're going up, we're going up. And it still brings goosebumps to my skin. I have to, you know, swallow tears. Um, it's so moving and because they're so heroic and because it's so sad and terrible what happened. And so it's a somber day. It's a sad day, uh, but it's also a, a day where we remember how we responded collectively to it. Uh, and 
the many individuals who have stood up to serve ever since, not just our service members in military uniforms, mm. but firefighters and police officers, particularly those who kept doing the job uh, despite what happened to them uh, that day and the many people that they, that they lost. Th those are the things that I spend 9-11 thinking about, and it's why it's such a sacred day and, and one that we need to preserve and, and never forget about. If I ever wonder about the what ifs uh, of what if 9-11 hadn't happened for me, it's about what if you know, that person who lost their life had gone on to, to live a, f a full, long life. You know, what might they have done or become, or would they have children, whatever it may be. As I, as I sit with now a four-month-old daughter, um, as I did on uh, Memorial Day this year, uh, thinking about the guys I served with who didn't come home from Afghanistan and Iraq, I couldn't help but think, geez, what if they'd had this opportunity to to, to hold a, a, a daughter in their hands, and they, and they never will. Um, those are the, the what ifs that I think I sometimes think about, but not, not in, re in relation to um, you know, how it's impacted me personally. What will you do Saturday, aside from starting the day listening to that recording? What will you do on Saturday? Uh, you know, it's, it's a somber day, it really is for me. Um, I treat it like Memorial Day. Uh, I don't do you know, a lot of, um, I avoid the ribbon cutting type, you know, things. Um, a couple of years ago, I went down to uh, one of the fire stations where they were going to have a, a public, you know, kind of gathering, um, uh, a ceremony. I went before the cameras and things showed up. Uh, it's just, it's not comfortable, I think, for some of us, um, you know, to um, take part in some of the, um, you know, the, the public uh, you know, type of events uh, because it's, as I've said, it, it's a sacred day, it's a somber day, and, and it's one that I spend in mostly in reflection. Do you think it'll always be that way? Should it be always that day, that way? I think it, it, it rises to that level for the country that it should always be treated that way. I, I hope even um, generations from now, that people are going to remember 9-11 um, and uh, all the individuals uh, that um, responded and, and stepped forward to serve the country uh, since then. I, um, I, I, I suspect that we will. Yeah. It, was, it was that big of a day in our history. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Can I, while he's still got the camera, can I ask a totally unrelated question about uh, Congress and the um, the infrastructure and the whatever you properly call the the other <laughs> infrastructure, the, the, the other infrastructure, yeah. the reconciliation, yeah. Yeah, uh, reconciliation, whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. And can I ask a question names. about that? The American Families Act. Yeah. As long as we're here, sure. That they might want to use that to me. Um, I was listening to some of the one of the Sunday shows and people talking about that, and it still seems unclear. What's going to happen with those with those bills? Whether the whether the infrastructure bill will get passed and, and put through separately? Whether there'll be a lot of resistance from some in the House uh, to doing that? What do you think is going to happen? Well, it, it is unclear what's going to happen. Uh, we have uh, a, a full legislative process ahead of us, and what might come out of it is anyone's guess. Uh, so th yes, there's certainly uh, some uncertainty there. Uh, what I do know is that on September 27th, we're going to vote on the infrastructure bill uh, because of my efforts and, and the efforts of eight other Democrats uh, a little over a week ago who extracted that. Um, not, not a promise. Some people have called it a promise. Uh, we, we got it put on the legislative calendar uh, through a, a binding rule vote. So we're going to vote on the infrastructure bill on September 27th, uh, and I hope that it will pass. I hope that it will pass uh, with strong bipartisan support the way that it, it did the Senate, you know, we could get that $1.2 trillion investment in our roads and bridges and our ports and, uh, you know, even um, you know, public transportation and for areas that depend on that. Um, you know, it, it's a good bill. It's a good jobs bill, and it's going to be good for our economy, uh, long overdue. Uh, so I'm looking forward, uh, I hope, to seeing that get to the President's desk and get signed into law in, in, in regards to the rest of it. 
uh, my perspective is that needs to go through the same rigorous legislative process that the infrastructure bill went through. Uh, and what I will or, or won't support, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be uh, communicating to my colleagues uh, as part of that process. Uh, and I already have started talking about it. There is a limit to what I think uh, we should do or can afford to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't agree uh, with some of my colleagues who are focused on 3.5 trillion. Some of them have put out even higher proposals. Uh, I, I think it's too much particularly on the tail end of trillions of dollars of bipartisan congressional action in response to the pandemic. Um, that was necessary. Uh, but uh, I think uh, policymakers have to ask ourselves at a point in a certain you know, constricted time frame, uh, is there a limit to what the nation can afford? I believe the answer is yes. So, a uh, long road ahead on, on the reconciliation bill, uh, but the infrastructure bill is ready to go, and uh, I, I would call on my colleagues, every one of them, to support it on September 27th.